Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on this uh, panel. It should be very enlightening since it's something that affects all of us, all the governments, all the corporations, and of course, all of our own devices and our own uh, personal computers. Uh, Building Regional Cyber Resilience is the title of our panel. Um, that in itself is not a controversial title. We would all like to think that there needs to be resilience, but how do we achieve that? Those are the challenges, and how do we thwart those who want to um, break the resilience, right? Um, a single cyber attack last year <clears throat> accounted um, for about $4 billion in economic damage. That's just one attack. There have been a number of attacks in 2017 that I, as a journalist for Bloomberg Television, covered quite extensively, including the Equifax uh, breach, uh, $275 million, uh, plus its reputational damage. There are a number of headlines of different breaches uh, and a lot of other attacks that we don't necessarily hear about. Uh, we want to tackle uh, the questions, how vulnerable are we all? How sophisticated are the attacks now? And how sophisticated will they be going forward? What is being done and what is not being done? Uh, and again, what kind of cooperation uh, can be reached uh, when there might be competing interests? Uh, my name is Stephen Engel. I'm the greater, uh, I'm the, excuse me, the chief North Asia correspondent for Bloomberg Television. I've been covering um, Asia for nearly 30 years uh, for various news organizations, including 15 uh, with Bloomberg. Uh, the panelists, though, far more distinguished than I, and I start here on the left, is uh, Christoph Nicholas, founder and senior vice president of Kodelsky Security, but also the Kodelsky Group CIO, chief uh, information officer. Uh, to his left is Jane Plunkett, the Swiss Re Asia CEO. Perhaps you can give us some good insight into the insurance angles uh, as well as other angles. Uh, over here is Stanislav Kuznetsov, uh, the deputy chairman of the Russian bank Zverev Bank. Uh, thank you very much. You can give very valuable insights into perhaps uh, the vulnerability of the financial sector. And to my right here is Trolls Orting Jorgensen, uh, the World Economic Forum head of Center for Cybersecurity. Hopefully, you'll be able to touch on just about everything. And the fifth member of our panel are all of you. So I would hopefully, throughout the course of this roundtable, uh, ask for your input and questions. Raise your hand. The microphone will come to you. And I'll be more than happy to have you ask questions. Please, no comments. Just ask a question and single question, not multiple questions, please. I want to begin it here uh, with Chris Stoff. Very simple <coughs> question, difficult to answer. How vulnerable are we right now? That's a good one. So I think the first things that was to mention is that in the cyber world, we are not equal. So there is a first the asymmetry between the attacker that needs just to find one single weakness in your ecosystem and uh, unfortunately does not have to follow any uh, legal framework. And the one playing defense needs to cover 100% of his base while being, I think, restricted to some extent by uh, the legislation. Uh, so that's the, 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 the first equation. When it comes uh, to defining that, it means that we are now really facing a global playground with different rule games, depending about where you, st where, where you stay, which country you are in, and in which industry you are. Uh, I think while basic attacks are still the majority of the attack that we are facing due to the lack of what we call cyber hygiene or I heard about cyber wellness, which is even better. Uh, people are also now facing more and more targeted and sophisticated attack uh, from governments to, uh, I think, critical infrastructure, large organization. Those guys need really to uh, face those kind of attacks, which are much, I think, uh, difficult to handle, and also difficult to explain and to uh, see. Uh, you have mentioned some of the attacks that uh, hit the, the headline uh, last year, uh, WannaCry being one, but okay. there is other one less visible that are also taking and keeping us busy when it comes to uh, the cyber resilience aspect. Uh, the fact that there is now the blurring of frontiers between the virtual world and, and the real world with all that force industrial revolution kicking in the digital transformation, we have more and more sensor 
being connected to the grid, to the internet, being part of the, that new game. More so, potential holes. So more potential hole. The ecosystem is expanding. <clears throat> and those are not always, I think, the priority when it comes to a cyber professional to uh, take care of them. So again, there is a, a complexity that is expanding as well as, I think, uh, more information be available for, for hackers. Charles, maybe I can bring you in as well. Uh, would you agree with this? And also, why are we more vulnerable now? Is it because we're too complacent? Because there are more attacks? There are more ways in? There are more incentives? Why? Well, it's a combination of all what you say. Uh, organized crime will primarily have three driving factors. Investment, risk, profit. In uh, cyber, it's relatively low investment. It's a relatively high profit, and it's almost no risk. Because the police, for various reasons, because crime doesn't happen in the same country. The perpetrators are not in the same country. They cannot really cooperate, so there is no risk. So that's the first thing. The second thing, I think, is if you look at the room here, that we are moving from PCs to mobile. That will increase the internet population dramatically. We will all Even have smartwatches. And you have smartwatch. But that comes in this second sentence. The second sentence is that you have IoT now. So you are connecting the physical world with the digital world. Anything. That was what Christoph said. That will, everybody says, but you know, it's hard to make estimations. But if we say that the internet population will increase from 3.5 billion to 7 billion because we all have portable devices. And at the same time, you connect approximately 50 billion devices to the internet that have machine-to-machine -machine communication. And you then enable us all to store all this data because we have cheap cloud services now, which was a problem in the old days. And then you, you utilize AI on all of that so you can get meaning out. Then, of course, you will see that your attack vector landscape is much, much broader now. So, uh, so that is, is a bad thing, and, and the risk is also. The good thing is that we are getting better, right? So, so, so we are actually getting better. Sometimes I say, but we are getting worse faster. And that, um, and that sometimes balance the, these two things out. But I think um, we will have a bumpy road ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's not over yet. Later in the conversation, we're going to talk about how we build a bigger wall, or if yeah. that's the solution. Uh, but at Fairbank, um, is it getting more difficult to keep your money, your secrets, your data, your clients safe? I think yes. I think uh, financial organization today is number, uh, target number one for cyber criminals today. Why? Because uh, they have main goal to stick money. And uh, before I would like to say that uh, cyber crime has no borders today, no national borders today. And one cyber gang, uh, for example, can be located in several continents and uh, commit a number of cyber attacks in a couple of hours, maybe in a couple of minutes. Mm. And uh, it causes uh, great damage to the, to the global to the global uh, world. Sure. And uh, I think, uh, no, small statistic. You mentioned that uh, 2000, in 2017, uh, the loss from cybercrime amounted uh, to $1 trillion and uh, is uh, projected to grow to $3 trillion in the next two years. In WannaCry and non page cases, it uh, were the two, the largest attack last year. Uh, it caused it $4 billion of losses. And this is uh, official statistic only. I would like to say that many companies, and everyone knows that many companies uh, cancel the fact of being attacked today. And uh, cyber attacks, uh, bring enormous damage to the real world today. And massive cyber attacks uh, cause uh, shutdowns uh, in the work of thousands of companies, thousands of organizations, in the hundreds of countries, and, uh, uh, including Russia. And you know that in case uh, WannaCry attack, 
Russia was uh, the largest victim in these situations. And uh, in these cases, threat actors don't uh, even need uh, go out uh, of their home. Right. And uh, cyber criminals have taunt national borders and what allows them to attack any sector in any country. And uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, in this situation, uh, geopolitical turbulence makes international collaboration more complex and slows down. More important, but more complex. Yeah, yeah, Look what's absolutely. happening in the world right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so for cyber criminals, have a lot of time today to cover up their tracks. Uh, and uh, this is uh, why complex cybersecurity system in the organization uh, is essential. And uh, I mean, uh, it is very important for, for the large companies or the large organizations to have um, developing cybersecurity system. And uh, uh, for our experience, uh, we can distinguish, uh, I mean, several key areas of uh, complex cybersecurity system within an organization. First of all, uh, processes, standards, rules. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different rules today in every country. The second point is, uh, Workforce, workforces, technical tools. The third point is education and uh, trainings. Maybe cyber hygiene, cyber culture, cyber uh, trainings on the different levels for technical staff, one cyber uh, security training, and for uh, high level top manager staff, the, uh, the another one. And the last point, is the collaboration. And collaboration on domestic level, and uh, very important to have collaboration on international level. Right, collaboration in good faith at a time right now, perhaps, yeah. when there is disruptions in the global economy, and even between the two largest trading countries and the two largest economies in the world right now, <clears throat> perhaps it gets knocked down the priority list. Would you guys all agree? And that plays to the, perhaps, the playground of the criminal. Does it? Um, yeah, I think maybe just I'd take a step back okay. and, and talk about um, the risk that we face here. We talked about risk already. So we all face all kinds of risks in our lives. And um, we always like to talk about, you know, how can I protect myself uh, in this new world of cyber? And if you think about the other kinds of risks we face as people, think about your health insurance. So, mm. so what do you do first with health insurance? You try to keep yourself fit. You try to eat properly. Um, you try to avoid getting sick. So you first you take many mitigation <coughs> efforts mm -hmm. to keep yourself healthy. And then when those don't work, then you go see the doctor and your insurance pays. So I think of cyber the same way. The first step is that you try to manage the risk, whether that's a company or an individual. Manage the risk first through these mitigants that were already mentioned. Um, having the right IT uh, protection, training employees on how to uh, respond to different kind of phishing emails. Those are the first steps in this kind of risk management world. Um, and then insurance comes at the end to transfer the risk that you cannot mitigate yourself. So I, I think it's, it's easy to talk about all the threats, but we also have to think about the risk and how right. do we manage the and, risk. And the mitigation of that. Yes. Yeah. As, and it's a new, well, an emerging, I would assume, part of the insurance world. It's, it's fairly easy to count up the number of cars and houses that are damaged in Hong Kong from the typhoon, but far more difficult uh, for a cyber attack because there's so many prongs to it, I would assume. Yes, and it's, um, it's as, as the other panelists have said, it it's crosses boundaries, it's not physical. So, um, so this virtual world uh, creates a very different tracking mechanism. How's it fit? Yeah, yeah, go yeah ahead. just to jump on that. So yeah. I think 
we need to step back and say, okay, yes, maybe we have missed the point. Uh, if you think about the software industry, someone was telling once that uh, you have a, a database, uh, you don't have any liability, you put four wheels around it, then you start to have some responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I think it's time to make, it, make sure that we understand that when we connect infrastructure, we connect uh, asset, we have also some responsibility and obligation. Uh, yes, great power, great uh, responsibility also. Mm -hmm. there. And I think we have neglected that. Uh, we all know, and there was a discussion yesterday about the lack of talent, the lack of understanding about mm. those risks at every level. And uh, I think, yes, we need more experts and more uh, scientists for that, but we need also to make sure that our leadership really understand what is at stake. It's not anymore the e-commerce on the side. I think every business is now are dependent about the internet and, and the capability to reach the global uh, footprint there. So therefore, they cannot neglect that or delegate that too much. I want to see more uh, deputy chairman coming to cybersecurity discussion, not only uh, CIOs and uh, responsible of cybersecurity center. Before we get into how we need to stop this or prevent it, um, we need to get a sense of the, the sophistication of the attacks and how it has evolved. Uh, do, they, do the hackers or the attackers have the same tools as those who are trying to put up the wall, yet they don't have maybe the same respect for the law, they don't have a bureaucracy within the government, they don't have bureaucracy within the company, and maybe they have a few steps ahead sure. of the defenders? Yeah, well, one of the challenges that in any type of battle you need to understand the battlefield. So on cyber, the battlefield are us. Our assets are connected to the internet. Your asset may be connected to the internet and the bad guy's asset will be also connected to the internet. So how do you build that situational, situational awareness mapping about that? Because on top of that, it's not a static battlefield. It moves during the, the year. So you may have an unpatched smartphone that will be attacking throws next, uh, and I will be taking benefit of that. So. How do I map that? How do I make sure that even if you are not in business relationship with me, I want to make sure that you are doing your duty of patching and taking care of your asset? So that complexity is, is by definition of the way internet has been built, one of the, the struggle. Because if I look at your asset, I may be uh, breaching some privacy law or I may be uh, over, overarching my, my, uh, my responsibility or duty. Whereas on the other side, the attackers will do that on a regular basis. And uh, they will know exactly when you are not doing your duty and they will take benefit of those. Is the answer, to, oh, go ahead. No, uh, I think that cybersecurity is, is more than tech and I know that you share that, Christoph. So tech is one part of it and uh, then you have people as another part of it and then you have processes. And I think that you, you need equally to have holistic security so, so you make sure that criminals are, are are rather lazy. They're not trying to, 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 to do it very smart to steal money. If it's easy to steal money, they will do it, right? So they will just misuse the, the lack of cyber hygiene in, in an organization to do it. So when I was in, in the bank, I always looked at who, who is the guys who are after me, the adversaries, if I know that. Then what is their motive? Right. Is it money, blackmail? Do they want to wipe? Do they want to steal IPR? And then I tried to anticipate what kind of tool do th did they have. Then I looked at my own network. Where's my known vulnerabilities? Then I looked at my crown jewels because you cannot, uh, you know, and you shouldn't, you know, protect everything at the same level. And last but not least, then I need to have my controls. Are they, you know, adequate to my mm. appetite? There is no 100% security in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. It's not in physical. So you just have to create that. And I think again that the criminals have the, the upper hand now because we are sloppy right. uh, in, in, as private people, first of all. Secondly, as businesses, the majority of big corporations have a very flat network. It's not segregated. So if you, they have an entity in Africa, you go in there, you can probably reach their data center in, in London or whatever. So there is a number of areas where we can simply improve. And I think of basically that insurance will, will do that a bit because you will have to pay an enormous amount in premium. To cover everything. Yeah. If, if you don't have, you know, basic security. So they yeah. will probably lift the bar a bit. Yeah. I mean, do we not concentrate on the psychology of motive enough? And, and do, do banks such as yourself just try to build a bigger wall? No. We, like bank, uh, have 
several products and, and insurance as well uh, today. This is modern products, and uh, I think uh, it, um, like bank, we have main goal to protect our core systems and our clients. <coughs> For protection of our core system, we have security operation center. This is modern center with many, many people. And uh, for protection of our clients, we have fraud monitoring center. These two legs uh, allow us to protect uh, and to be, uh, uh, to be very, very, very good on the market today. And uh, I think it's uh, very, very important to have uh, the exchange of processes. 80% in every company, in every large organization, to change processes and standards. Um, the software, technical tools are not expensive or are very expensive. But 80% of the work in cybersecurity is changing of processes. This is a successful mm. way to be uh, successful. Mm. I think, uh, if I may add, that money is one thing that you can steal. And that's, of course, very unfortunate. Normally, banks will reimburse the customer, at least up till now. But I'm more concerned about the future where my whole life is online. You know, it's my identity, my, my, uh, maybe my biometrics. Uh, you know, everything I do, everything I like, everything I... And we're kind of pushed that way. We, we are society. pushing that, yeah. So it's not like I want my whole life up on the web. <laughs> no, but still you sign, uh, you know, a contract. If you want anything for free, you are the product, right? Yeah. Uh, so you're not getting free lunches here. So people then want to have your data. And if you are... And that is also something we in the future need to protect is our... Is, is our privacy and integrity on top of our economic security, where you can replace... You can replace uh, money. Money, but, but you yeah. can't replace everything else that I... And my whole track record. You know, my phone knows everything about me, <laughs> where I am, what I listen to, what I like, what I watch, what I read, what I spend money on, anything. That is also valuable for criminals. And, many other. and your phone watch you. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it remembers. Put everything. the black tape over the camera, right? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And any one of us are now the system administrator of our phones. Mm -hmm. So, except if it's a corporate phone and someone is looking at your back and taking care of the security there, as uh, as individual, we have the duty to keep that secure. And nobody likes the burden to update every day. I think nobody likes the burden to to have a different user interface every day. As, as a group CIO, I know that I ask my guys to be business focused and to make sure that it's the convenience aspect that uh, on our system that is important. But security comes with a price tag, so yep. you need to do that and you need to enforce that. And, and that's, that's the difficulties, because nobody wants to change a system that works. But there is a monthly patch on every system. So except some uh, disruptive car company that are pushing your update on, on the car, uh, have you heard of any update, forced update on, on a car before? Average car have about 20, 25 uh, computer built in. Do, do you think that there is no bugs in those uh, appliances? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a change of mindset that we need to, uh, I think, accept, unfortunately, to the make sure that we will uh, do that, uh, that type of upgrade. The vulnerable ecosystems are vast. I mean, I only have just brainstormed a few corporate and financial institutions, governments, individuals, airlines, automobiles, IOT, energy sector. We saw a state-sponsored attack of the U.S. energy sector, I believe, last year. Medical systems yeah. are at risk. Uh, again, as I said, the financial sector goes on and on. Um, back to the insurance sector, uh, how, how do insurance companies or are insurance companies adequately assessing risks when each one of these ecosystems have their different vulnerabilities and different preparedness. It's one of the challenges because we live in this, uh, as we said, this interconnected world. Um, but all of the things that we insure are also connected. So, so it's a, it's been a you know multi-year journey to think about uh, how can we model this? How can we partner with with uh, some of the companies that actually know how to model this risk differently? 
Um, that's what insurance companies do all the time, is model risk and try to predict what it looks like. Um, but this one is, is a bit more difficult. And um, I think the interesting thing always about these discussions is we tend to focus on the large companies, the large mm. banks. Um, mm. But the reality is there's a <coughs> tremendous number yeah. of small and medium-sized enterprises uh, all around the world, particularly in this region, and uh, they don't have the same sort of security measures uh, yet, and the cost might be too high for them. So I think that's the other thing we should talk about is these smaller companies and uh, how can they get the same sort of risk mitigation as the larger companies do. Well, how do they? And, and are they targeted? Are the small, are the, yeah, are I the think, big guys attacking the yeah, small they are, guys? Yeah, they are now? all looking at the global markets as an opportunity with a couple of people and PC, uh, they can access those consumer, but without having maybe the knowledge nor the focus on, on the, the, the basics, uh, cyber hygiene or, or security. So we need maybe to create incentive for them to uh, look at that. I think when a country is pushing for, uh, I think, clean energy, they are creating incentive. Mm -hmm. Are we doing the same in cyber? If we really want to tackle that, are we, as a community, as a public-private partnership uh, organization, right. recreating that uh, incentive? So where does cyber hygiene, to borrow your term, where does it begin? Cyber hygiene begins here, right? So it's that I update now to iOS 12, that I make sure that I have secured everything, that I look into my privacy settings. I don't, you know, every time you download a application, the first thing it asks, you could I have access to your camera, to your microphone, to your location, to, no, what the hell, you know, there's no need for, for, for that. And then secondly, I would say that you asked about cyber criminals. They, it's, it's organized cyber crime. They're very, very good, and they will attack medium uh, companies as well. They do it very much and very organized by st stealing credit card credentials, buying online from these shops, they sell a commodity to a money to a mule that receives it, mm -hmm. and this small entity is going to pay because the bank is not going to pay. It was a, it was a, probably a card that was stolen, and the credit card company is not going to pay. So it's the person who have lost the asset that is going to pay, and I think that again shows you that it's not a. It might be a faceless crime for the crime committer, but it's very much a a crime with, uh, that have implications on the victims. And that's also why I think it's so important that we discuss it and that we protect the good side of the internet and the ability for the internet to drive prosperity and growth and lots of good things, but we simply need to do a bit more in the security agenda. And we tend to forget that. We spend a lot of time talking about cyber currencies and we know that there's been a nefarious angle to that as well. Has that promoted maybe the propagation of ransomware that we've seen? I saw a 2,700% increase, 2,500% increase in 2017. There's no doubt that, again, when I was a CISO in a bank, all the ransomware attacks or, or that, that we got, or blackmail attacks, we should pay in Bitcoins, Bitcoins period. Yeah. period. Um, when I was a police officer, there was loads of child sexual exploitation where you could watch kids being raped live, and then you paid for that in vouchers that was anonymous also, or in, uh, Bitcoin was not so up to date at that time. So, so anonymity in, in, in that area, of course, fuels a lot of, of activity. That, that, that is simply as simple as it is, because people don't want to get caught, so you try to minimize the risk. Right, so do you take away through government intervention, the avenues for people to get rich that way through a cyber currency or cryptocurrency, or does it, again, start with building a bigger wall? That's, that's the big question. I think it's a bigger, it's a bigger question beyond cybersecurity because that, that there might be other drivers in that. So I'll just narrowly keep focus on that, that virtual currencies is very, very much used in cybercrime, yeah. period. You've seen that too with your numbers. Yeah, definitely. That was something that was adopted uh, very first way by, by the bad guys because it, it gave them, I think, uh, uh, that uh, sensitivity. They, they, they cannot be traced or, or difficultly traced. And, and 
also the issue is that law enforcement, at least they, we've started to see bitcoins, what, eight years uh, use, being used by the bad guys. If you go to your preferred law enforcement eight years ago and say, okay, I have a, a ransom in bit, bitcoins, they will look at you and see you from which planet you are coming from. <laughs> so I think nowadays I think it's more common, but uh, I think they are using also that uh, uh, delta uh, between the people and, and the education. But we should not confuse that the the transportation layer for uh, crypto and currency blockchain is very, very good. Yeah. You know, so, so it's, it's not connected. Sure. Yeah, and that can be used for security purposes also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what, what, what would you like to see as far as government and private partnerships? So it's, um, I mean, it's a bit hard to dream about everything, but, uh, but I would say there's a few things. So, um, so for example, data protection regulation does help. I uh, always have to be careful with regulation to have the right level of it. Um, but I think it does help also in terms of setting standards. Um, we see that in, in certain countries and that it does help us to create uh, a, more, um, a more predictable insurance market by having these standards and, but and a bit of regulation. But it creates silos of protection, if you will, individual countries, right? Instead of for all of us. Yeah. I think well, there's probably a hundred different nationalities in this room. I think that's, I mean, maybe that's a question for the World Economic Forum yeah. uh, to think about how do you bring the whole world together in, in terms of these things. <laughs> no, but the, the reason I like the mission that we are trying to get off the ground now is that it's a fact that the world gets more and more online and, and the risk will still increase. At the, at the same time, the trust between nation states is going the other way. So it's not easy to get law enforcement to work together from Russia, China, US, UK, and EU. And that's, of course, what the criminals benefit of. That's what I said, it's, it's risk-free. That, that, that's the first thing. Then, on the positive thing, I actually happen to believe that if you take the best and the brightest we have in private companies, in governments, and in academia, and bring them together, and put a problem, a cyber problem, in the middle, we can do something about it. Mm. I, 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 I simply think we can. The problem is to bring them together and, first of all, create trust between corporations. In the beginning, banks would never say anything to each other because that was a lack of faith and whatever. I think they have changed that now. I think that everybody realizes that trust will be the biggest competitive differentiator for the future. But to secure the internet and make it crime safe is not a competitive differentiator. We will work together. I'll work with a Russian yeah. bank with no problems, with a Swiss company, or with everybody. And that is what we are trying now to do by bringing these together in a neutral place, Switzerland, right. in Geneva. They might not meet in Beijing, in Moscow, or in Washington, but they might meet here and we might be able to bring people together. And if we do that, and we are not trying to do a PhD over the next six years, but try to keep up pace and deliver actionable, impactful solutions, I think we can actually move the needle to our advantage. Right. I don't think it's, it's so difficult that we should give up and no, no, we cannot. Of course we can. Well, as an executive of a major Russian bank, is there a trust deficit right now in the world that pushes this down? I think... Uh, the private companies can be faster, can be faster in comparison with officials, with law enforcement as well. And uh, we can push, for example, yep. officials as well. We know our problems, we know exactly our clients, their problems as well. And uh, like example, um, last year in Russia uh, was launched uh, the government program, uh, digital economy, in uh, five directions. And the fifth direction is cybersecurity. And I run Center for Competence of Cybersecurity from business side. And uh, we have great opportunity to, to create the special plan for changing the situation. And uh, we can push officials to change the situation. Mm. They change legal system. Mm change rules, change standards, change education, and uh, I think change uh, technical rules in 
many, many companies. And uh, you mentioned that, uh, that huge companies have expensive uh, cybersecurity complex systems. Yes, right. But uh, many, many countries have uh, legal law for critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And law enforcement responsible for this uh, infrastructure, that's critical infrastructure. And who is responsible for smaller companies? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a big question today yeah. in Russia as well. I think trust, the trust issue is suffering from one thing. That is that you put everything that happens on the internet into the same basket. I'm trying with my sensor to separate. The sensor will only deal with cyber crime, greedy cyber crime, terrorism or hacktivism, not nation state activity. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nation state has always spied on each other. That's espionage. They've, they've done that. And they will do this also in the next 200 years. You're saying, including in the news media, we lump it all into one threat. You know, to try to influence opinion and what about from one business? country has been doing, you also went on during the Cold War. You know, before the internet, you try to influence politicians and whatever. That's that's one thing. I'm trying to separate that because that pollutes the whole discussion about trying to do something about the organized crime. So they again are profiting from our inability to work on that area. There might be gray areas, fine, but still, if we take away the gray areas, we have 70% of the evil things going on on the internet that we can do something about. And I think that I've actually received from from a Russian bank, information about crime going on in a Western country. Yeah. They just handed it, and I could then send it on to that company in that country and say, you are infected by this and this and this, and do something about it. And they did, and saved loads of money. And I think I've got from you four reports. So again, it can be done if, yeah. if we want to. We need collaboration for sure, yeah. and to build on what Stanislas has said, sometimes a gentle push on the back uh, from the private sector to the government helps. I think it's a matter of leadership. In any type of new threat, sometimes there is that hot potatoes uh, going around there. And uh, uh, also in Switzerland, we are pushing now the government through uh, Digital Switzerland to uh, speed up a bit the process when it comes to uh, digitalization of the, the, the country. And uh, I think one of the outcomes was that they agreed now that they need a Mr. or Mrs. Cyber at the government level, at the top level, right. to retackle that. Because before it was kind Cabinet of... Cabinet level position. Yeah, it's always the same. So it's okay. Is that the army uh, uh, in charge? Is that uh, the law enforcement? Or So everybody were involved, nobody was in charge. So I think now we are tackling that. And uh, that's also something, it's a pattern that we see multiple times in yeah. country. Uh, even in the army, sometimes you need a joint cyber defense uh, organizations to tackle that. So. We have open book for Center for Cybersecurity. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right here. So we need a multilateral approach, yeah. but at a time when bilateralism is taking center stage right now, yeah. we can't even come to conclusion or agreement on climate change, for, for, for God's sake. So uh, it seems like it's a bigger task than just sitting here and saying we need to cooperate better. Yeah. It's a much bigger task than yeah. that. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, it's definitely a big task, but I, I would just pick up on this framing of the issue because I think it's a really good point. It's, yeah. it's always easy in these settings to talk about these, these uh, really scary scenarios and uh, sort of state-sponsored uh, attacks. But I, th I think the point is that you make is um, most of what we see is actually it's business-related. Business um, we have standard practices that can address yep. it. And um, if you think about sort of what risk you face, you, risk, you face the risk of uh, data protection. So that's one thing, stealing the data. The second risk is um, what we call business interruption. So does your business, um, is, it, is it closed for a period of time and you have a loss of income because of that? Um, and then you have this, this, this bigger threat, right? This state sponsored. And I think if we think about those first two risks, it's more manageable, yep. it's more modelable. Yep. Uh, the third one is it's a bit hard, I think, for the private sector to deal with. Frankly. We might get there if we deal with the two first. Yes. And there might be norms, like there are norms in warfare and whatever. Yes. But that's not a starting point. Starting point is that we all... I remember when I was in Europol, I had actually two Russian captains from the Moscow police working because it was child sexual exploitation. Everybody hates that. Everybody wants to do something about child sexual exploitation. 
I think we can do the same with pure cybercrime. Mm -hmm. I think we can. At least we should try. And then we'll build trust. Don't expect miracles. <laughs> but what is the alternative? Yeah. Can we ever be 100% safe, though? No. No, no, no. no. Right. Nowhere. How many people in this room have been hacked or think they've been hacked? <laughs> Pretty high number. Pretty high number. <laughs> How many people have no idea? <laughs> well, that's the <a> rest. <laughs> Anybody who says that, they probably have been hacked. They hacked, don't right? know that it was hacked. <laughs> well, because you mentioned that, okay, 2017, there were a lot of high profile, whether it's what, Wanna Cry or some of the other big attacks. But there are many other attacks that are happening already this year that we don't know happening yeah, behind they, the veil. I think there is, uh, there is a continuous noise of attacks, or so the opportunistic yeah. type of hackers that. Uh, just look for unpatched, unsecure devices. I think if you go to the global situation space, we, we demonstrate some, we, we took an attack from 2014, so four years old. And at that time, we started to monitor the, let's say, quality of the reaction of the security professional. So in a matter of two days, only 17% have done their duty. After a month, 50% of them have fixed the issue, but more frightening, we, we checked last December, four years later, there was still a 100,000 web server, not patched for that single attack four years ago. So the opportunistic one will always look for that and they will always find their share of, uh, of that. The same way as you are receiving a, a spam email, sometimes 0.01 person will click and that's good enough for them. So, so that noise is ongoing. And most of the big corporations, most of the country are dealing with that. I'm not saying that they are solving that, but they are dealing with that. But my kids or my father are not aware of those kind of things. So those are the typical targets. And then for, I think, big corporation, big country, you have tailored and, and sophisticated data that are ongoing. Unfortunately, it's not because you don't see that in the news it's that they are not happening. Yeah. On, on average, uh, an attack will be uh, sitting in your ecosystem, in your servers, for more than 100 days until they have their phone. So, so even if you are looking as, as, a, as an educated company on cyber, you will probably miss it for a couple of months. Right. And a lot of these attacks into a corporation, I know at Bloomberg, they put the onus back up onto the individual employee as well. Oftentimes, we're the point of vulnerability, aren't we? Since there's so many different avenues to get into a system. Bloomberg is completely safe. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Let me just say, in case my boss is watching on TV. <laughs> but it's, a, it's the individual yeah. that makes a, either an unwise click or, um, or what? It's not always just the IT department. It's to your point about, you know, can we ever be 100% safe or eliminate 100% of the risk? It's, it's not possible. But if you think about all the other risks in your life, you can't eliminate those either. Yeah. So what, what we've done over the years is gotten smarter about those things. I gave the example of health insurance. We all have gotten smarter about how things affect our bodies and how to remain healthy. And uh, I would say we need to do the same thing with this threat. We need yeah. to get smarter about yeah. it and understand how things affect us. Yeah. And then we can manage our own personal risk yeah. of it. And better. criminals are lazy again. They don't want to spend $1 to steal 50 cents. Yeah. They, they, they want to do it because it pays off. So I think that if you make it a bit more tricky because you have cyber hygiene, you have what you should have also in the company, we can now drive it down to an acceptable limit. The only thing we need still is the, the third, you know, nation state always say we can prevent, we can protect, and we can prosecute. That's the three ways that you influence crime in a country. And you can increase punishment or whatever. But here the third pillar is a bit gone because the criminal will never ever visit China to steal money, intellectual uh, property or ID, will always be on a distance. So, so it's out of reach for law enforcement, which again then demands that law enforcement works together if you want to drive down the risk. Otherwise, everybody wants to well, be a cyber criminal. What's the best deterrent? Because I was seeing number two, you know, you talk about the, in the aviation industry, there's gonna be a pilot deficit of X, X, X percent. There's, in the cancer world, there's gonna be oncologist shortage. I would assume there must be, if this is growing threat, there's going to be a shortage of experts to protect But already systems. now, I think the number is, at least at the press, around three million globally that you lack of cybersecurity experts. And that is something you can see very clearly also, and I would guess 
the, secu the insurance industry will also uh, adjust premiums about that because they will, I remember when we uh, had a cybersecurity insurance, they will come and assess our level, our expertise, our tools and whatever. So that is part of it and we lack that. Yeah. So that is one of the projects we have in the sensor is to see if we can produce more yeah. cybersecurity workforce so at least you have a talent pool that you can begin with. Yeah, but going back maybe problem. to the analogy of cyber hygiene, it's the same as the, before we had proper hygiene there, yeah, there was a lot of infection. So we are not discussing, discussing about the number of doctors or surgeons that we need. We need to make sure that everybody understands the basics there too. And that started at the kindergarten. I have the luxury to live in Switzerland. We still have policemen coming to the kindergarten to explain to our kids how to cross the road because the big innovation last century was the car. Yeah. <laughs> so they are still starting there or how to uh, brush their teeth or stuff like that. So let's make sure that we have the basics also understood yeah. by, by our kids there. Yeah. And then they will do the reverse mentoring. They will teach uh, our teacher. They will teach yeah. our, our uh, elderly people. And, and that will at least uh, clean the, the basis. Because if we only add doctors, surgeons, security experts, yeah. We're not tackling the issue. Yeah. But I would just say, Chris, that I think that maybe our education system also need adjustment. Sure. We cannot wait five years to have a computer science expert, right? Mm -hmm. And we have loads of talent in my world that want to be the good guys, but they don't want to go to a university for various reasons, right? Sure. Yeah. But they are very, very good. And if we could get them into some online diploma courses of three months, six months, and nine months, I can't think that we can actually have somebody moved into then a SOC and then they can grow it into that. So I think that's also maybe part of it. A change how in how much do you spend on cyber security and how do you know it's enough? We have, <laughs> we have uh, in cyber security division today in Sberbank 800 uh, guys. 800 employees? Eight, 800 employees today and uh, in dollars I think <laughs> maybe is it enough? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> no, it's not, not, not that secret. How much? Uh, in rubles, this is two billion rubles. Okay. It, it is how many? Two million rubles. How much? 30, 30 million dollars. 30 million dollars here in, in the year. It's not expensive, but uh, I think um, uh, I give one example. Uh, we need another level for sharing information. Uh, for example, we have we, you, we are using today AI in our uh, core systems, in our cybersecurity complex systems. And for example, when we have telephone number, cyber criminal number, telephone number, we can see in one second the whole net, the cards, the accounts, the banks, the addresses and the different, different things. And can, we can share this information with law enforcement, with our colleagues. And this is very, very important to have automated platform for sharing information. Yeah. It's very important, and I hope in so World Economic Forum, Center for Cybersecurity, we can organize most faster in comparison with yeah. officials. But to come back to your SME point, I think that's where we are not equal. Right. On average, companies spend between, let's say, 5 to 20 percent on IT spending. And out of that, roughly between also 5 to 10 percent are spent on security. Yeah. If, if you have a big number in terms of your top line revenue, then you can do things. An SME, even if uh, they are doing a, a few hundred K, they will have only the money to, to maybe pay for the, the antivirus, and that's it. Mm -hmm. so, so that's where they need help, because they, they cannot scale, they cannot uh, really have their internal program there. So they need to rely on someone else. Uh, and, and that's a big issue because that's a big part of the economic. Uh, uh, but we AI have AI will be both good and bad. Mm -hmm. I just attended a, uh, a, a, um, a, a presentation today by an Israeli professor that explained that AI is used by you uh, and other ones in, in defense, but adversarial AI is now the new black for the criminals where they can mm -hmm. much, much faster scale their attacks and right. they can find vulnerabilities much faster. They can bypass other AI and they, they can find actually, vulnerabilities quicker. Yes, and they can invent new types of crime. So, so that's areas that we need to look into uh, also because the problem with innovation is it's done for the good 
part, but very, very soon you look for the bad part, and then we just need to be prepared. It's not too complicated. It's just another thing that we just need to take care of, right, to, to look at this also, because every weapon will be used uh, for, for two purposes. No. And you build a weapon, it's always used, right? Yeah. Yes. Expensive or not. Uh, Sberbank is the largest bank in Russia in Eastern Europe today, and the first company in Russia on capitalization. We have 300 employees, 300,000, sorry, yeah. employees in 60,000 branches. And we have 100 million, 20, 120 million clients today. It is, it is, it is a huge responsibility for our clients. Yeah. I was just thinking, it's, it's interesting, because in all these different sessions around the forum, uh, some of them are talking about, you know, will all the jobs disappear because of uh, automation and <laughs> robots? And it's kind of interesting, because our discussion here is actually about creating jobs. Yeah. We're saying we don't have enough sort of digital risk engineers. We, we don't have enough support for SMEs. So it's kind of interesting that actually this is probably creating quite a few jobs in the future. AI will probably take out some automated job in yeah. the in the lower end, mm -hmm. but you will have a need still for the human brain and interaction. To assess motive. The, to yeah, assess. in many, many years to come. Mm -hmm. Because you can teach an AI everything, but not emotions, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from the audience? This is your chance to, for your burning question. Come Very on, good. We have covered everything. Here's a question here. My name is Hugo Rohner. I'm the CEO of Skid8. I have a question uh, for you, CEO of Swiss Re. What are you doing in your job to make sure that you're uh, having things under control and you're not being hacked as a company? So we're, we're like all other um, financial services companies. Uh, so I think you know, you've given all the good examples of uh, what the banks do, and insurance companies aren't different. Uh, we have a certain uh, responsibility to protect data, and uh, we have all the you know, common IT measures that, uh, that all the banks have as well. So, so I think insurance companies are not different in that way than banks are, uh, given the large volume of personal data that we have. Um, we also do a lot of work uh, with our employees in terms of teaching them yeah. what it means. Uh, to, we do little tests uh, to see do they click on the mail that comes through. And, um, and of course, many people click on the mail, and that helps them, it helps to teach them that they shouldn't do that. Because this awareness of the risk is really the only way um, to, to help prevent some of these things. Making everyone more aware of what's coming in all the time, I think, is, is the key. So this training around uh, hygiene or, or cyber defense is, uh, I think, of critical importance. Maybe, oh. maybe this is how culture. Mm -hmm. This is how cyber culture, maybe. Yeah. 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 To create some cyber culture. Security yeah. needs to be part yeah, of your corporate exactly. DNA. Risk culture. Yeah. Yeah. On, on, on average, one out of four or five will click on a phishing email mm -hmm. in a company. One, one out of? Out of five. So it means that you need just to target five, ten people to, to do so that. The, the when you train them, you can go down maybe to one out of 20 or one out mm -hmm. of 40, but still, there will still be someone that click on that email that they've been told not to click on. And that opens a hole. And that opens a hole. So we should not only blame the end user, so we are discussing about that there. So they need for sure be, be educated and help, but as, as an IT guy, you need to make sure that that email doesn't reach you also. So it's a, it's a balance exactly. between, yeah. I think, what we can do in the, in the, in the back end as well as how to educate uh, end users. How big an industry is the insurance industry for cybercrime, for a company to take out a policy to protect and to mitigate their losses of intellectual property, yeah. data theft, financial? How big a market is that becoming now? It's a, it's a growing market. So there are, uh, there are as many estimates uh, as there are risks about how big this market will be. Um, but I think it's important to know that it's, a, it's not a new market in many ways. So it's been a, a market in the United States for uh, a few decades now in terms of data protection. And there's about $2 billion of uh, insurance premiums written in the U.S. Uh, to protect this. So if you think um, how can you scale that, uh, you can imagine multiples of that around the world. Uh, but it's, in the U.S., it's not a new market in terms right. of data protection. I was seeing one number. The reason I ask you is cyber insurance market on track to triple its worth to $7.5 billion by 2020. Sounds small number. $7.5 billion? Yeah. Well, I think the, the issue is that, again, the first defense is to uh, protect your IT system, train your employees, and, um, and then comes the risk transfer. But, but if you have so many dollars to spend in your budget, 
um, most companies spend it first on protecting their IT system. Yeah. Are there more questions? Back here. Um, what's the most creative cyber attack or phishing attempt that you have either encountered or know of? Can maybe ask Kodelsky here. <laughs> So I think, uh, just to take the simple one, because I think it's, uh, it's interesting, even if you educate people not to click on that email, now hackers are calling you before, say, hey, guy, you will receive an email from my CEO and you have a, an important uh, payment to be done. And that lowers drastically the, the sensitivity of, of the guys not being able to click because you have broken that. So someone called me to do that. So as soon as you mix what we call social engineering capability, you engage with people, and then some technology, then you are very efficient. So sometimes very basic, you call the guys, and you will receive an email, click on that file, it's very important, and you're done. In Russia, it's a huge problem with social engineering too. Yeah. Social engineering, yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the best vectors they use right now, social engineering. They go to LinkedIn because everybody will update anything on LinkedIn because you want another job, right? So you, you put all your <laughs> credentials in, and then they will search. If they want to search Spearbank or Barclays or Kudelski, they will search for employees that are employed in IT with uh, admin rights and whatever, and it will narrow down. Yeah. And then sometimes they will even then predict that they are uh, headhunters, so they will send you an inbox. Uh, they are, have a profile as a headhunter. They say, I have this great job, $1 million plus a bit extra. You have a really good profile. Would you be interested? Uh, yes. Uh, could you send me an updated CV? And you send an updated CV with all kinds Give of private all your personal information, info. your private phone number, <laughs> your private address, and your wife's yeah. shoe number, and everything <laughs> to convince this guy. And then they will use it yeah. against you. And, and they do it, right? So mm -hmm. they're very, very good in, in, in you that. You can look at the internet on Black Hat this year in, uh, in Vegas in July. One girl was uh, good at social engineering and was just calling your bank pretending that she was the, the spouse of that guy, and they've added her on his bank account. And he, she put a, a baby crying in the, in the back, <laughs> background, and she was just arguing with the guy. Yeah, yeah I, need issue. I need to pay that payment. I did not receive my uh, credential. So can you add me that? In two minutes, they were in. Two minutes. And you know what? Uh, fake sites, social sites. Mm. So have you checked how many of you have a duplicate? If you're important enough, you will have an, a, a Facebook page or Twitter page, I can assure you, or LinkedIn. So my previous boss, we took down 272 face, fake Facebook accounts every quarter for him. So people produce them with the right pictures and names and then other ones, they really want to be friends with the chairman of a big bank or whatever. And then again, they start social engineering. Loads of potential here. Hi, you welcome the days of just having a virus on yeah. your computer. <laughs> it was easy. Yes, over here, Sarah. Hi, I'm, I'm Sarah. I'm a global shaper from Vienna, Austria, and I work for the Impact Hub. And you mentioned quickly the um, energy sector. And as far as I know, the energy sector is connected in whole of Europe. And I wanted to know if you know about um, how, well connect, uh, how well protected the the energy companies are and how likely a, <clears throat> a European-wide blackout is? Yeah, I think there was a U.S. power grid attack in 2017. Well, see, this is critical infrastructure. But, yeah, it's, you know, I think it will, be, it will be classified as critical infrastructure, so it will normally be on the radar of the national governments. That doesn't always increase cybersecurity, but that's an indicator that they take it serious. There is a number of tools that are very, very good to attack grids and electricity power stations. And we actually work with, with the energy sector because, again, here they, they want to work together because they have similar problems. And the enemy could either be a nation state for preparation or it could also be somebody who wants to blackmail them because they know that if you, you blackmail, if you, if you encrypt a power station or make it go down and all the lights go out in London or Brussels or whatever, you're in deep trouble, yeah. right? So you will pay your ransom. So I, so I think that they have a double dip. We have only one minute. Does anybody else have a last takeaway from this? Oh, you have a last question? Okay. Yeah. Quickly. Hi. Uh, the question is just that, what do you see in the near future, the nearest collaborative initiative across uh, at the national levels? Have you come up with something? I hope that we will be able in, in 
in the platform uh, in, uh, in the cyber center in the World Economic Forum to have partners. And we have a very good beginning from Russia, from China, from Asia, from Africa, from Europe, from US, from the Americas, first of all on state level, secondly then on business level, and thirdly on business level in various sectors. Mm -hmm. Now we start rolling the ball, I think, on, in the crime area, not in the other areas. And I think that we day by day build some kind of trust and that we all share the same desire to make sure that the internet is not polluted by crime and that's regardless if it's you're trying to steal from a Russian, a Chinese, an American, or a Dane. I think we share that. So I'm very optimistic. Again, don't expect miracles, but yeah. we, are, we are actually moving. And we should all practice cyber hygiene. That's yeah. very okay. important. All right. That does it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you.